Thank you. And now for something completely different. <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is the holy grail of healthcare. There are 40 million patients worldwide, and there's no cure. Over the past 25 years, $30 billion has been invested in an unbroken string of failed clinical trials. Today, I'm going to tell you about something completely novel. At Lucadia Therapeutics, we've developed a non-invasive method to predict who's going to get Alzheimer's disease and when, years before a cognitive impairment begins. We've also developed a device, an implantable device, that reverses the, the, the cause of this pathology, which should prevent Alzheimer's disease from occurring at all. So today I'm going to talk a little bit of science, quite a bit of science. I'll discuss our path to market and then end with a nice little hockey stick revenue projection that everybody loves. So let's start with, with August Dieter at the beginning. A German woman, in 1900, she started behaving strangely. She was confused, disoriented, couldn't remember anything new, and she frequently got lost. Today we'd call this mild cognitive impairment. When she became paranoid that people were trying to kill her, the family took her to the Frankfurt Asylum where she was seen by Alois Alzheimer. Alzheimer, really. Okay? She died in 1906, and he did pathology on her brain, and it was the first definitive feature of the disease that would be named after him. Okay. What he saw was on the right side here. There was a wasting away or atrophy of her brain due to the loss of billions of neurons. Neurodegeneration is the primary feature of Alzheimer's disease, okay? He was a brilliant neuropathologist and he also discovered two features called plaques and tangles. The tangles are on the top here. They're the little, um, the little uh, Eiffel Tower shape remnants of neurons that have been sick and died, the cytoskeletal remnants. And on the bottom are plaques. These are waxy, tiny waxy deposits of amyloid beta aggregates that form in between the cells in the interstitial spaces. Okay? Now plaques and tangles and neurodegeneration don't just suddenly appear everywhere in Alzheimer's. They start in a very discrete area up here. So if we take a brain, chop it down the middle, and look at the inside, this is the medial surface, okay? The pathology starts here. This is the, the medial temporal lobe, okay? This area contains the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, which is critical for making new memories and orienting us in three-dimensional space. It also contains the amygdala, which tells us when to be afraid of things, and the piriform cortex related to that. It's, it's older than the rest of this neocortex. The neocortex is all this stuff. This is allocortex, it's an older part and it does things a little differently. So the pathology starts here and then it spreads outward from there. It's like a campfire that turns into a California wildfire and overtakes everything, okay? If we look at the brain from below, here's the medial temporal lobe, right? The place that's affected right away is right here, the basal forebrain and this lollipop structure here. That's the olfactory tract and olfactory bulb. And those are important for smell. They mediate smell, okay? So if it starts here, what is peculiar about this part of the human brain that seeds this pathology? It has to do with a basic housekeeping function that all tissues take care of, and that's clearing interstitial spaces. That's the spaces in between the cells, okay? So the smallest blood vessels, capillaries, have these tiny holes in them called fenestrations. They're too small for white blood cells and red blood cells to go through, but they're, they're large enough that plasma leaks out into the tissue, and that's the source of interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid is constantly pushed into the tissue and it flows through picking up insoluble metabolites and debris, fragments of apoptotic cells, exosomes, other large things that can't diffuse too easily across the blood vessel, right? And it carries it all to open-ended blood vessels, or lymphatic vessels, I'm sorry. And the lymphatic system takes it to lymph nodes and eventually it makes its way back to the bloodstream. So if there's a problem with this, what happens is there's an accumulation of proteins in there. And proteins like transferrin and immunoglobulin A, if they're at high concentrations, they can make this amyloid fold, which makes them insoluble, okay? 
And if that happens, you get amyloidosis, and it can occur all over the body, okay? Amyloid, remember amyloid beta? But the brain, it doesn't do it this way, okay? Because the blood-brain barrier will not allow fenestrations to form. It's protecting the brain from, from blood-borne viruses and bacteria that can't get into the brain. Although the brain still needs to do this function, it needs to clear the interstitial spaces, and it does it a different way. So here's a little basic neuro, neurodevelopment, neuroanatomy. The brain and spinal cord develop from a tube, a neural tube. So if we cut the tube and look at it end on, it's like that. We have the, the brain tissue, and in the middle, there's a lumen. The lumen is, has got cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. And what the brain does is it makes CSF. Oops. Went back. I have to click it. Sorry. OK. So it makes a CSF, and it percolates outward, picking up metabolites and debris, and carrying them to around the edge here is the subarachnoid space. It's a very thin volume on the surface of the brain. Now, a larger brain, so as the neural tube, all right, so the neural tube grows, convolutes, expands, twists into this incredible structure, the cerebral cortex. Okay? And inside that, the lumen has turned into four ventricles. We have two lateral ventricles shaped like a C, a third ventricle, and a fourth ventricle here. They're producing CSF. Okay? The CSF goes out, it follows white matter tracks, and percolates through the gray matter, picking up metabolites and debris, and carrying it to the surface of the brain, to the subarachnoid space that covers the brain. Okay? The area we're interested in is down here, the temporal lobe, the medial temporal lobe. Remember, it's an older part, and it does things a little differently, okay? So if we look at the brain from below, okay? Here's the medial temporal lobe here, right? And it's connected to the olfactory system. So on the surface here is where the metabolites and debris accumulate, and they follow this loosely packed fiber bundle, which is actually projecting this way, down here to the olfactory bulb. And what happens to that metabolite-laden CSF after that? Well, it has to do with the anatomy of the skull. So if we take a skull and chop off the top, look down from above, here's the front of the skull, the back's down here, right? There are two little depressions that the olfactory bulbs sort of slip into, okay? It's called the cribriform plate. And we zoom in and we can see it here, okay? At the bottom of the cribriform plate, are holes or apertures. Those accommodate odor, odor receptor fibers that are projecting up to the olfactory bulb. Here, here it's down here. Here are the older, oh, odor, odor receptors down here lining the nasal cavity. And they send processes up here that bundle together and go through these little apertures in the cribriform plate up to the olfactory bulb. Now around those fibers are little channels that the CSF can go the other way. So the CSF that's in this area is going down into the nasal mucosum where there's lymphatic vessels carry it away. It doesn't drip into the nasal cavity, okay? Now, an interesting thing happens to the cribriform plate with age because it's part of the skull. If you look at the skull of a baby and the skull of an old person, they're different because there's been bone added in certain places, okay? And the cribriform plate here of a 26-year-old, if we did a CT scan, we did a CT scan, here it is here, notice that the floor bone barely shows up because it's so thin. Compare that to an 80-year-old's cribriform plate and notice how much more bone there is on the cribriform plate. There's constant ossification. It's happening to everybody in this room, okay? See this, this Christigalli here? It's much smaller there than it is here because of all the extra bone that's been deposited. Now the thing that happens with that is it starts to close off these apertures. So the escape route for this CSF is being diminished with age, okay? And our hypothesis is that it's slowing the clearance of CSF, interstitial CSF, through this tissue and allowing things to accumulate, resulting in things like amyloid beta causing uh, plaques, okay? So to test that, we did an animal study. We took some ferrets and uh, human neurosurgeons involved in this study with us made a little hole in the snout, pulled the tissue off of the cribriform plate and sealed those apertures with dental cement and sealed it up and they were fine. 
okay? This guy is two months after the surgery. So they're, they're fine, and we started testing them in, in a maze, a tunnel maze, because ferrets love to run through tunnels. So we would test them, and after the first month, we, we didn't see any differences in the behavior. They were pretty much the same second, third, fourth months. It's like, geez, there's something going on here. But then we hit the fifth and sixth month, and we saw that the occluded ferrets took significantly longer than the non-occluded ferrets, right, in the fifth and sixth month. So this is like MCI for ferrets, okay? And then we took their brains, and this is what the brain looks like from below of a ferret. The front is on top here. Here's the olfactory bulb of the control, and the olfactory bulb of the occluded ferret. There's massive degeneration, okay? We've lost 40% of the volume, right? Also down here, the allocortex in humans, the equivalent in ferret is right here. And it's also smaller and smoother because of massive degeneration. So we've lost 40% of that area. So it seems pretty good. Let's go back to the human cribriform plate and do a high resolution study with very high resolution imaging of isolated samples. You can see here in the control, there are holes for the apertures, right? And the Alzheimer's case, there's a lot more bone ossified. If we spin it around, you can see it goes all the way through to the other side. And then if we highlight some of the apertures in red and take the bone away, notice how these apertures are completely occluded and these ones are much reduced. So what we've got is this going uh, toward occlusion. And we found this consistently in uh, 70, uh, uh, cribriform plates we studied here is about a dozen of them, where the, the uh, non-Alzheimer's subjects had much more opening capacity for CSF flow than the Alzheimer's cases. So the mean here for Alzheimer's is there, mean there for the controls is there. So it looks like we've got a, a pretty good system here. It's CSF coming out of the ventricles, washing through the tissue, clearing away. It goes down the spinal cord, and in most cases, it drains along the, the spinal nerves and the cranial nerves, including the first cranial nerve, which is the olfactory nerve. Now, maybe you're sitting there, you're going, okay, well, that looks good, Doug, but this stuff is all from your lab. Tell me, is, is anybody else working on this? Do you have any clinical data? Well, yeah, there is. A few blocks from here at NYU Medical Center, what they did was they looked at amyloid beta efflux from the brain with PET imaging. And they specifically found differences right here in the cribriform plate. So focusing on there, they saw in the Alzheimer's patients versus the controls, a 66% decrease in A beta efflux across the cribriform plate. Okay, so this is very nice independent confirmation of our hypothesis. So, the thing is, when we had the, um, the gradients, right, there's, there's a, a point here in the middle where we're, we're going down, and then there's a threshold here. If we can image enough cribriform plates, we can model and say where somebody is, what's their age, their rate of ossification, where are they going to get past that point, okay? We can predict when it's going to happen. Okay? And to do that, we're doing deep learning. It's a type of AI. There's two, two ways to really do this, and we're going to do them both. One is unsupervised, one's supervised. So unsupervised is you have a large amount of unannotated data, and you throw it in, the computer will use the algorithm, and it'll divide them up and make a dendogram showing the similarities between them. So we're doing that. But we're also doing annotated data because we know a lot about the structure of the cribriform plate, right? So here's a cribriform plate, and we have these apertures in here. We've developed software to identify those apertures. Here it is. All right, see the little curves there? We can represent it in two dimensions. There, you can see all the apertures. And then we have another software called the Lacadia Aperture uh, Calculator. So we can actually figure out exactly how much space there is, what's the capacity for any given cribriform plate. And doing that, what we can do is model and figure out where everybody is, but we need large data sets to do this type of deep learning. And so we started something called Project Cribros. So hopefully the audio will work on this because we're using social media to, to recruit 2,000 subjects for this study in the next six months in Southern California. What if you could help 
help solve Alzheimer's disease just by sharing your brain's profile. History's biggest advances were made when people worked together. Project Kribros is a team of scientists, clinicians, engineers, and participants with a shared vision of a world without Alzheimer's disease. Project Kribros has developed new technologies to assess brain aging with incredible precision. We are looking for 2,000 people between the ages of 20 and 90 to help unravel the mystery of Alzheimer's disease. You will take memory tests, provide your unique health profile, and become part of the genomics revolution. Your participation will help solve healthcare's biggest problem, and you may become eligible to participate in a prevention study. Get involved and help end Alzheimer's disease. Join us and become part of the solution. I'm 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 part of the Yeah. We had a little, we, we had some, we had some fun with that. It goes on a little bit, but, uh, but uh, yeah, we had a great time making that. So, so in about six months, well, less than six months, we'll have our 2,000 um, samples and we'll have the algorithm working beautifully. So we'll, we'll roll out what we're going to call LGCA, which is our, our prognostic algorithm. So it'll be fast, reliable, a non-invasive evaluation. And the, the big advantage will be MCI. So mild cognitive impairment is something that 20% of seniors have. And not all of them will progress to Alzheimer's disease. We think we'll be able to discriminate which ones do by how much ossification they have of the cribriform plate, because MCI could be due to other factors. And we think with this method, we can, we can figure out who's who, and that'll be a big benefit. And not only that, we can go earlier, since we're modeling age, we could start at 50. It could be something like a, a, you know, like a prostate exam or, or maybe a mammography, although far less invasive, because you just sit in a chair for 20 seconds, um, where we can model that. And what we envision is healthcare providers saying, okay, well, this person, we're concerned about maybe them going that way. We want to know how many of our million or five million patients are going to get Alzheimer's and when, okay? They send the CT scan to us that they do at their own place. We push it through the LTCA and send them a report, all for the cost of a, a standard blood panel, a couple hundred bucks maybe. Okay, so in a sense, what we're, we're doing is we're becoming more of a, a healthcare data plan. And we have proprietary algorithms and software, and our database, of course, is proprietary. And uh, the more that we use this algorithm, the better the resolution. It's almost like the Google algorithm. The more data that goes into it, the better it gets. And that's, that's kind of what we're thinking. So it's, and I don't have the time to talk about that, but maybe later. Um, so it's one thing to tell somebody, okay, you're gonna get Alzheimer's in, in eight to 15 years, start planning now. It's something else to be able to do something, offer them a solution. And that's our second product, it's Arethusta. It's, uh, it's an implantable device that goes in the cribriform plate and it restores the CSF flow, okay? So it goes right up the nose, okay? So the people who will benefit for this uh, have MCI. Oop, I'm running out of time. So prevent Alzheimer's disease and the people with MCI, prevent their progression. And um, the surgery is actually pretty easy. It's, it's like a wisdom tooth extraction. It's a, it's a twilight anesthesia that goes up. And then uh, here's what it looks like in a cadaver, the human cadaver. The brain is taken back. You can see the device poking through into the brain chamber. Okay, so we have our, our go to market in six months will have rolled out LTCA and any pharma company populating their Alzheimer's drug trial without using this to populate their study is going to be a dinosaur. So we think that that's a potential revenue stream for us. We'll also be applying to the FDA for approval for MCI. Uh, and also after we have five years of data from these subjects, we'll be able to know how good it is a predictor of Alzheimer's disease. We'll also be doing a clinical trial by putting the device into people with MCI and finding out if it improves their MCI, which it should, because it'll clear away all this gunk. And then we'll follow them up for five years and find out if they indeed did not progress to Alzheimer's disease. I'm running out of time, so I'll do that. So the revenue projection looks pretty big. I mean, Humira is the biggest selling drug in the world. It's 20 billion a year. 
we're saying, oh, well, by 2033, we should be hitting 20 billion a year. But remember that Alzheimer's by 2050 is going to cost the world $4 trillion a year in care, a trillion dollars a year in the US alone. So $20, $20 billion to reduce that significantly is, is not that much to ask. Um, so it's a company, it's me, uh, some neurosurgeons involved in the company. Joe's our regulatory guy. A couple of our coders there and, and neurosurgery residents. That's kind of it. We're coming along. We're probably going to do Series A in 2020 after uh, LTCA rolls out. But happy to take some questions.